Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's July 7th. Well, I am recording this tonight, and it's a few days after the 4th of July, and we still have 4th of July fireworks going off. So if you hear that in the background, that's what it is. Don't worry about um, me. I'm okay. All right, here we go. Today we're going to celebrate a bishop botanist whose love of plants was second only to his love of God. And we'll also learn about the botanist daughter of a key botanist in England. We'll celebrate the botanical entrepreneur and the creator of the influential Curtis Botanical Magazine. We'll also celebrate the writer who lived and worked in his incredible home called Abbotsford, complete with impressive gardens and on the banks of the River Tweed in the beautiful Scottish borders. In today's Unearthed Words, we honor an English author and poet, and we grow that garden library with a book about gardening in your front yard. It's packed with ideas and projects for big and small spaces, and this idea of gardening in your front yard is gaining popularity and acceptance, just one of the positive effects of dealing with the pandemic. So stay tuned for that. And then finally, we'll wrap things up with the story of a popular mystery writer who loved gardening and roses. But first, let's catch up on some greetings from gardeners around the world in today's curated news. You know, a few days ago, I talked about someone who had sent me pictures of their Susan lilies, and now mine are blooming. And they are so beautiful. In fact, I was having my daughter help me. We were taking pictures of the lilies, and I put them up on my Instagram story. So if you want to see them, head on over to Instagram. You can catch it all there. I'll also try to put together a post of some of the pictures of the garden up here at the cabin so you can get a feel for what we're doing. I'm in the middle of sketching out a design. It's a work in progress. And I think I might actually call my friend Patricia Chandler Newport. She helps me with the Still Growing podcast group. And she's in the middle of wrapping up a beautiful transformation of her small space. It's in her backyard behind her new home. And I think she just did an excellent job. If you want to see pictures of it, just head on over to the Still Growing podcast group on Facebook and you can check it out. It's just beautiful. Very inspiring. All right, my friend Diane sent me a picture of a beautiful flower that's been making the rounds on Facebook. And they almost look too good to be true. They look like something out of a Dr. Seuss story. The name of the flower, the common name, is Creeping Avens. And the picture you see on Facebook is actually of a seed pod, not the flower. The seed pods are cool because they look like pink hair that has been twisted, almost like the tippy top of a cotton candy cone. Those fuzzy pink seed heads follow the buttery yellow blossom. So in the early spring and summer, you get the little yellow blossom, and then the seed heads come on and you get that little pink fuzz at the top. Now, the botanical name for this plant is Geum reptans. Once you understand that this plant is native to the mountainous regions of Central Asia and Europe, you get an idea for the zones that it'll be happy growing in. Don't fall for some of the reports that this will grow well in a zone four. There's a reason why you have never seen this growing in a Minnesota garden. In fact, most plant websites agree that creeping avens grows best in zones 6 through 8. And you know, that's a good rule of thumb. If you see a plant that you've never seen before, not in your yard, not in any of your garden friends' gardens, you should approach it cautiously. 
I know it's easy to get excited. In fact, in the days before COVID, I would be in nurseries every single week and I would be walking down the row and I would see something and I would actually feel my heart skip a beat. I was so excited to see this plant and I would walk right up to it and think, oh my goodness, what is this? Pull out the tag and take a look at it and then find out, oh, this is zone five. Oh, this is a tropical. It's not for me. I think we all do that. But the difference between a new gardener and an experienced gardener is that experienced gardeners know to look for that zone, know to look for those growing conditions, and new gardeners may not. Their exuberance may get the best of them, and they may plant it without looking at the hardiness zone or maybe not even appreciate what that tag is even telling them. Anyway, I think you can apply the same standard to images of beautiful flowers on Facebook. If you see a plant and it's not growing in a friend's garden, it's not growing in, in a garden in your zone, it's just a random picture of a beautiful flower I say, approach with caution and do your homework. Now, as for creeping avens, I'm confident you're going to see this picture probably this week or maybe all through the summer. It's probably just going to keep circulating because it really is a stunningly beautiful and unusual bloom, or I should say seed pod. In any case, I'm glad my friend Diane sent it to me because I love learning about new flowers, but I'm also really happy that I have enough wisdom about gardening to do the research, to do the homework around the plants that I'm going to pick to put in my garden. And sadly, creeping avens will not be in my garden. All right. Now, if you would like to participate in the Gardener Greetings segment, just send your pictures, stories, emails, birthday wishes, anniversary wishes, what have you, whatever you want about your garden, you can send to me and I'd happily touch. And I'll happily talk about it on the show. Just email me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. That's jennifer at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget, while you're home, you can use the power of your smart speaker. Listen to the show by just asking Alexa or Google to play The Daily Gardener podcast. And they will. It's just that easy. Here's today's curated news. First up is a post that featured Rod's Farm. This was on England's National Garden Scheme website. It's basically a garden profile. Now, last night I shared a beautiful video where the owner and garden designer, Carrie, walks us through this stunning garden. It's really quite something. And just think about this as you're watching the video. This garden was completely started from scratch in 2005. So there's hope. There's hope for all of us. Now, Carrie had to deal with a very challenging site. You can get a sense of the scope of this garden. It's very big. There were woods on the north side, open pasture on the south I think most people would have been hard-pressed to know where to start. But Carrie broke the property into many different gardens. There's a pond. There's a gravel garden. I was very intrigued by that. There's a beautiful wildflower meadow. There's a formal garden. And she also has something very unique, a dovecot with 50 white doves. Beautiful. And in the video, you can hear them cooing in the background. It's just too much. Now, what I said when I shared this in the Facebook group is that words really can't do this garden justice. So I can talk to you about it and pique your interest, but you really should take a look at this video. And I don't know about you, but I am extra grateful for garden videos during this pandemic. Thank goodness for narrated tours just like this one. Now, if you'd like to check out this post for yourself, just head on over to the Facebook group for the show, The Daily Gardener Community, 
and search for the word farm. And this post about Rod's farm will pop up and you can watch the video and read all about it. Well, that's it for today's gardening news. Now, if you'd like to check out any of my curated articles or original blog posts for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group, The Daily Gardener Community. So there's no need to take notes or track down links. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the anniversary of the death of the passionate plantsman Bishop Henry Compton, who died on this day in 1713. Compton was famous for his large garden at Fulham Palace, which was home to more than a thousand exotic plants. Naturally, Compton was drawn to rare plants and new specimens, and his position as a bishop gave him access to the botanical discoveries that were being sent to England from the American colonies. For instance, we know from his correspondence that Compton was especially intrigued about the swamp honeysuckle from Virginia. Compton sent a young priest and botanist named John Bannister to Virginia to botanize for him. Bannister went on to help found the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg. Bannister proved to be a wonderful contact for Compton. He sent him seeds to grow at Fulham Palace, along with detailed notes about his discoveries. Sadly, Bannister's life was cut short when he was accidentally shot during an expedition. Like any avid gardener, Compton sometimes felt a little guilty about the amount of money he spent on gardening. So, as penance, he not only collected plants for his own garden, but he also was a patron to important botanical figures, like the Tradescants. And today is the birthday of the botanist Francis Stackhouse Acton, who was born on this day in 1794. Francis was the daughter of Thomas Andrew Knight, who served as the second president of the Royal Horticultural Society. Thomas assumed the position at the urging of his friend, Joseph A. Banks. Now, Knight's inclination was always to turn inward. He was a little introverted. Banks helped him overcome that. Thomas had inherited 10,000 acres of land, and he used the property to conduct all kinds of experiments on plants like strawberries, cabbages, and peas. Frances's father encouraged her to pursue her education, and she often recalled that, quote, the hours spent with my father in his study or in his garden are among my happiest recollections. A born pragmatist like her father, Frances assisted him with his breeding efforts, which were always designed to help make better plants to feed the masses. Frances contributed to her father's work through drawing. She illustrated many of her father's writings, and she established herself as both an accomplished botanist and botanical artist. And today is the anniversary of the death of the botanist and entomologist William Curtis, the creator and publisher of the influential Curtis Botanical Magazine. He died on this day in 1799. William founded the magazine in 1787. Curtis Botanical Magazine made him wealthy, and he often remarked that it had brought him pudding and praise. William had started out life as an apothecary, 
but in short order, he discovered that it could not hold his interest. Sir James Edward Smith recalled that Curtis loved being a naturalist more than working in the city. He wrote, The apothecary was soon swallowed up in the botanist, and the shop exchanged for a garden. William was a founder of the Linnaean Society, and he also authored a book about the botany of London called Flora Londiniensis. In 1779, William transformed his Lambeth Garden into the London Botanical Garden. William wanted his garden to be a place where visitors could learn all about plants and their uses, not just for food, but in medicine and cooking as well. William was at heart a pragmatist. When William heard from visitors that they were in need of a resource that they could turn to for growing the plants that they were acquiring, William came up with the idea for his magazine. On February 1st, 1787, the first Curtis Botanical Magazine was published, quote, for the youth of such ladies, gentlemen, and gardeners as wish to become scientifically acquainted with the plants they cultivate. The magazine owed much of its success to William's promise to provide his readers with helpful illustrations. Artists like James Sowerby helped ensure the magazine's success. In addition to his legacy left by his flora and his magazine, the genus Curtisia honors William Curtis. And it was on this day in 1832 that the author and poet Sir Walter Scott arrived back at his incredible home called Abbotsford on the banks of the River Tweed in the beautiful Scottish borders. Scott's health was failing him, and he asked that a bed be set up in the dining room so that he could look out and see the river, the trees, and his magnificent gardens. Lying in that room, Scott was surrounded by portraits of his ancestors. And when he was finally near death in September of that same year, just two short months later, ever the author, Sir Walter Scott, is said to have requested a quill and some paper. And truly, he died with a pen in his hand. Abbotsford is impressive, and it seemed destined to become a public place. In 1853, his granddaughter Charlotte inherited the estate. Charlotte cleverly decided to add a path in the Morris Garden, which would bring visitors around to the side, thereby keeping part of the estate and the gardens private for the family. During Scott's time at Abbotsford, he added oak and pine trees, and he expanded the walled gardens. And today, niches in the south and west walls still hold Scott's collection of Roman panels and other artifacts. And Scott's gardener, William Bogie, added narrow beds of hollyhocks and roses along the arcade and a leafy honeysuckle-covered pergola. With paths and hedging that divide the garden into four quarters, Scott's walled garden is still a sight to behold. In Unearthed Words, I'm sharing a poem by A. A. Milne, the English author and poet. He became famous for his story about Winnie the Pooh. But he also wrote this wonderful poem called The Dormouse and the Doctor. And it's a favorite among gardeners because it has so many garden references in it. Here's The Dormouse and the doctor. 
There once was a dormouse who lived in a bed of delphinium's blue and geranium's red. And all the day long, he'd a wonderful view of geranium's red and delphinium's blue. A doctor came hurrying around and he said, Tut, tut, I am sorry to find you in bed. Just say 99 while I look at your chest. Don't you find that chrysanthemums answer the best? The doctor stood frowning and shaking his head, and he took up his shiny silk hat as he said, What the patient requires is a change, and he went to see some chrysanthemum people in Kent. The dormouse lay there, and he gazed at the view of geranium's red and delphinium's blue, and he knew there was nothing he wanted instead of delphinium's blue and geranium's red. The doctor came back, and to show what he meant, he had brought some chrysanthemum cuttings from Kent. Now these, he remarked, give a much better view than geranium's red and delphinium's blue. They took out their spades, and they dug up the bed of delphinium's blue and geranium's red, and they planted chrysanthemums yellow and white. And now, said the doctor, we'll soon have you right. The dormouse looked out, and he said with a sigh, I suppose all these people know better than I. It was silly, perhaps, but I did like the view of geranium's red and delphinium's blue. The doctor came round and examined his chest, and he ordered him nourishment, tonics, and rest. How very effective, he said, as he shook the thermometer, all these chrysanthemums look. The dormouse turned over to shut out the sight of the endless chrysanthemums, yellow and white. How lovely, he thought, to be back in a bed of delphinium's blue and geranium's red. The doctor said, Tut, it's another attack, and ordered him milk and massage of the back and freedom from worry and drives in a car, and murmured, How sweet your chrysanthemums are. The dormouse lay there with his paws to his eyes and imagined himself such a pleasant surprise. I'll pretend the chrysanthemums turn to a bed of delphinium's blue and geranium's red. The doctor next morning was rubbing his hands and saying, there's nobody quite understands these cases as I do. The cure has begun. How fresh the chrysanthemums look in the sun. The dormouse lay happy. His eyes were so tight he could see no chrysanthemums, yellow or white. And all that he felt at the back of his head were delphinium's blue and geranium's red. And that is the reason, Aunt Emily said, if a dormouse gets in a chrysanthemum bed, you will find, so Aunt Emily says, that he lies fast asleep on his front with his paws to his eyes. Oh, isn't that adorable?